there was a year eight group and we were looking at light and heat. One group decided that they wanted to investigate how sun cream stopped you getting sunburned. So, the obvious solution, obviously, would be to get four chicken legs, this is obvious when you think about it, to smother two of them with sun cream, factor 10, factor 100, thinking about variables, and then stick, I still don't know for the life of me where they got that massive UV light from, <laughs> don't ask questions, and to put it underneath, and, to, and then to test the temperature of it, and see the difference. I have not got the creativity uh, or the initiative to think of that, but the students did. Um, and I interrogated them about it, but not in a Socratic, so I can't, I can't speak, sorry, it's a teach first, they've upset me, don't they? <laughs> Not in a Socratic way, because the Socratic way, I want my students to have the answer that's in my head. Because if we start talking about that, we don't get that truth uncontaminated by power. Interestingly, the lesson before, they set that up, but instead of the UV light, they had four Bunsen burners underneath. <laughs> <laughs> and they turned our classroom into like a Dixie chicken <laughs> retail. So I had a chat with them. <laughs> we're outside on the playground because we had to evacuate the school. <laughs> and, you know, and we talked about, right, well, why doesn't the Bunsen burner model the sun? What have we got wrong there? <laughs> okay, but then they came up with this idea. Um, another thing they did, they were looking at digestion. Different group this time, looking at digestion, right, how do we want to, how do we want to do it, how do we want to learn about it, they wanted to dissect some rats, apparently you're only allowed to do it in sixth form, but we did it anyway, <laughs> they dissected rats, they pulled out the small intestine, which is out on the right side, and they measured the small intestine, okay, then they measured the length of the rat, and they worked out the ratio to see how long the small intestine was in the rat. Then they measured the length of meat. Sorry, they didn't do that. They measured the height of meat. That's something completely different. And they tried to then <laughs> estimate the length of my small intestine. And then they started to think about, well, is the human digestive system the same as the rat system? So it's all this stuff that they can do. And it's to do with this. There's no hierarchy. There's no hi hierarchy of intellectual capacity. Just the way it's manifested itself. It's not the teacher being the fountain of all knowledge and the kids being ignorant and lazy, that we unveil it because we are that teacher. And when we talk about some schools and they bang on about obedience and they bang on about discipline, in all the teaching, all the punk learning teaching, all this emancipation teaching, there needs to be authority. But the authority is not the difference of knowledge or understanding or insight, and that's a key, key thing. Um, the other thing we did, we learned about periodic table. What better way, I didn't come up with this, is to create a huge periodic table. Uh, this was a school in Leeds, and I was working in Leeds, and the smokers used to congregate around there, that little smoking bit, so when they were having a fag, they could go, yeah, this is killing me here, <laughs> and this, and this. And they came up with this themselves, yeah? So it's this idea that some kids are already defined, they're already categorised, they're already classified, but with education we can change that because there is no hierarchy. So it's about the inequality of education. And if we are talking about this, it's no good saying that we're committed to it. We need to be thinking about how we can do it and how we can express it on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, just before I finish and get lambasted by my colleagues, it's kind of all about this. Marky e. Smith, I believe, is a great student anarchist of our time. And, he, and he, you know, he says that a lot. If you're going to play it out of tune, make sure you play it out of tune properly. You need to know the rules before you can break them. And it is all about that. I'm not a huge fan of Ken Robinson, I have to say. But I kind of like this. And I thought it was really apt for the surroundings here. Because if you kind of look at the list of people on there and then work out how many of them are actually teaching, how many are actually in a school and not just go to schools on a monthly basis and do a bit, then we really need to consider this because we have visitors, friends, colleagues coming into our school and judge us and nobody likes them. And the main excuse is that they can't teach. They were rubbish when they taught. They don't teach anymore. Yet we can get consultants, educationists come in 
And we sometimes believe what they're saying, even though they don't teach the same as Ofsted. And sometimes it's right, we believe what we want to hear, rather than believing something that we don't want to hear. <coughs> so Derrida says this, he says that we should be we should be really careful about the person that's outside of the system viewing in. And we need to be really careful that this idea of the philosopher, the educational expert, the outside spectator that tweets every five seconds, that blogs every week, that writes books, that actually we should, you know, kind of be thinking about we're the people here. As uh, Dutchka says, we're the people here that can make the difference. We can make emancipation happen in classrooms and schools, primarily in your classrooms and your schools. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. I was going to play that track, but we'll play it after. Is there any questions? <laughs> I do have a question. Yes. I was really interested at the beginning when you were talking about um, you didn't necessarily believe traditional progressive teaching was the way forward and you, you sort of um, posited the idea that there might be a different um, a different way. And I just wondered what you defined or where you got your definition of progressive teaching from. I just used, to be fair, the definitions that are banded around because I don't believe there is a traditional progressive way of teaching. I think everyone that's taught for longer than two, three years realises it's a, it's a mixture, it's an amalgamation of, of all two of them. But lots of people write books, lots of people will, will talk about traditional wrong, progressive wrong, you can only learn this way, you can only learn that way. I'm, I'm kind of talking about emancipation where Biesta talks about emancipation is caused primarily with traditional teaching. I'm kind of arguing, well actually, if progressive teaching, what, whatever it is, is done in a certain way, then we won't get emancipation from that because of the independent learning. Right, I would like you to learn independently, but I want you to do this, this, and this, and this for me. So you've got no say in that matter. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Brilliant. Any other questions? Yes, just what you just said, we've got such a massively overloaded curriculum now. Yes. The new one that's coming. It's so hard to teach in an emancipated way because you just bam, 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 bam. So going back to... Uh, Great question, yeah, go, and going back to that, uh, the stuff that uh, right at the start, I think it was BS, it might have even been Miles Horton that said that we've got a moral and political obligation to do something. I mean, that's why I get out of bed in the morning, and I'm not suggesting that people do stuff because I tell them to, but I think we have got an obligation. The society's knackered, it's not equal, it's, it's unjust, it's not right. I believe the two biggest influences on that are the media and education. We won't be able to change media because it's controlled not by government but <coughs> huge bankers and corporates. But we can, as a group, reclaim pedagogy. Is that right, Deborah? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> to do something about it. So it's a moral obligation, in, in my mind. And this is just, just my ideas blabbering on. Yes, at the back. What do you do about the communities that actually don't want their children to achieve? Because it would actually need to leave in that community. Well, we're not necessarily saying that they would leave. And again, that's a great question. It's an issue for the community. It is. It is. And we, we talk about that in that vision, in the, in the Dixon City Academy vision, about the power, about having a positive legacy. And that positive legacy might be going to college, it might be going to university, it might be going to apprenticeship. It's individual. It might be, it might be setting up a business. Right. But the actual community is trying to hold them back because it might mean you you leave that. Yes, true. Well, that's why we talk about. I mean, this is for this is for uh, students, teachers, governors, parents, and it's this idea that we want we want the best for kids, but we we need to make them aware of what's going on in society. <coughs> and if they want to do something about it, then they have got the skills, the attributes, the characteristics, the desire to do something about it. But again, that's a great question. Yeah, it's not going to be easy, is it? Deborah. You talk, I can't remember which slide it was, Tate, but one of those slides was about narrowing the debate to the extent at which people become passive because yeah. it's not really a genuine choice. And interestingly, this morning there's a, there's a policy exchange gig on today, a, a kind of rival conference. I was now. going to go to that, but I wasn't invited. I can't think why. <laughs> I wasn't invited either. It's weird, isn't it? Um, 
But uh, one of the tweets that was coming out of that conference was that the difference between Michael Gove and Christopher Moon's policies at the moment are so thin you couldn't even get a credit card between them. Um, and I think that's what we've got now. We've got a, redu we've got a reduced level of consensus, or a great level of mm. consensus, but a reduced level of yes. choice. Um, and I think our challenge, really, as, as teachers, is to find that kind of radical practice within our own classrooms and almost to subvert that, that lack of choice by giving children more choice. Definitely. You should have done the speak, Debbie. You've done a lot better. <laughs> <That's all right. laughs> but, you know, it just kind of had, I'd like, because we have got a little bit more time because we've pushed the timetable on a little bit. Okay. Um, I'd like to open it up to the room, really. You know, where are those subversive practices in our classrooms? What are we doing, you know, to to make children think that the world can be different. Because at the minute, what they're seeing is quite a colourless palette, I think, of choice for the future. I don't know. It was just kind of really, not just to you, but to everybody. I, I think part of it, sorry. <coughs> we, we had a question this morning about whether or not you know, these books are, are, are not allowed to be taught. And they probably had a massive sort of outrage over it. Those, those books, whether they're on there or not, are to be assessed. That's the question. Which books are being assessed, not book, which books are to be taught. Mm. And you know, I, I did some working schools, working and sort of training other teachers. And I had a question to me, and a girl said to me, why, why have I never had a student that's been impassioned by literature or history in the way that I am? Mm. And my question back to her was, when's the last time you taught something that wasn't for assessment? And she never had. Mm. And actually, you know, we, we can get hold of that power and that choice in our own classrooms, as Ken Robinson was, you know, hijacked by Tate to, to say to us. Mm. Um, but I think that's the trouble. We, we kind of, I think we give the power away that we have. Mm. I think when we sort of feel that we're being, you know, disenfranchised and being put down, we don't recognise the actual power that we have. And actually, you know, and there is a cramp curriculum, there is a lot of stuff to get through. But actually, I think if I, if I go in there in the early stages and I'm engaging, I'm infusing the kids and they're getting really excited about literature, mm -hmm. then when it comes down to it, it's just kind of right, yeah, we're excited about literature. This is the one we're going to have the quick test on towards the end. But education is not about it. But a head teacher friend of mine talks about two train tracks. He says, this is education and this is assessment. And you take your kids along there and then towards the end you switch points and you yes. sit on that track for a bit. But that's not what it's all about. Yeah. And, and the trouble is sometimes, and I understand why, and it's a massive pressure, and it is a point, and again for raising the panel this morning, for head teachers to, to be the buffer zone, or senior teachers to be the buffer zone between that and the classroom. But it, it is about us actually saying, you know, we're going to take hold of that bit, and we're going to resist those pressures, and we're going to have the confidence to explore and explain what we want until we get to that point. Mm -hmm. so. Can we just, um, on that point, I wonder how many of us um, are in who are in secondary um, are starting to look at year, year 8 and year 9 and are starting to give um, students more GCSE assessment questions as part of their assessment. And I'm, I'm trialling something hopefully in our department next year where we actually in year 10 we do diagnostic assessment and not even go near a pass paper in year 10 because they've got terminal exams and that can come in year 11 and that what they need to know is the is the content and the, the, the science that they, yeah, yeah. in my case, that, that they're learning and it, that will develop and they'll, be, they'll, be, they'll learn how to answer the questions for the exams once, the, once they yeah. get to that point. Well, I, and yeah, I said the same. I, yeah, I, 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 I'd move the literature that's supposed to be studied at GCSE or A-level down yeah. to give them access to better li or different literature, okay. not, move, not move the assessment framework down. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm just going to say, I think I'm an assistant principal and teaching and learning and it's going to be imposed for a year. And as I've been going through this year, more and more staff are kind of opening up. I think what we're talking about is you do need support from senior leadership. When people are coming to me and they're saying, I feel like I've lost my confidence, I feel like I don't like myself in the classroom anymore, and I've lost my personality, because I'm jumping through so many hoops, because they think that's what they need to do. And I think when you talk about grey and paletteless, what you need is passionate teachers who are putting all of the learning into a context that's relevant, and what you're saying is that making clear that the classroom, you're not always the right person, that the kids have got something that's valuable and on offer, and that you're interested in what they're saying and, and letting them sway the learning. And I think that those things and the passion are what's going to make it really relevant and interesting to kids so that even if they're not going to leave their communities and they're not going to pass their GCSEs with the grades they should, 
they're still enjoying education and see the value of it. And I think that comes from empowering our teachers and making them feel like they're appreciated and that they can take risks in the classroom and show that passion. And if it digresses and they're not going to hit that lesson's objective, it's not the end of the world that they can just have that dialogue with the pupils and let them leave the learning for a little bit. Can I second that? Because, I mean, one of, one of the reasons I bailed out of teaching was because I was trying to do what I thought was best for the kids. And my managers would not support me in that. I, I had targets that I had to meet that were, well, I thought they were ridiculous. And if I didn't meet those, then that was it. I mean, you, as, a, as a sort of base level teacher, you can't fight that. It has to be done further up. Yeah. Oh, unless someone knows how to do it from the bottom. You have to stick with it and get promoted to senior leadership, and then you can be promoted. That's the advice you're giving earlier. You don't get promoted. Don't you turn gamekeeper? I was, I was really lucky. I began teaching in 1971, and there were brilliant years mm -hmm. because we didn't have the sort of control that head teachers, aping Ofsted, you know, have seem to have now. I, but I, I, there's got to be an end to this and I think it's through teachers working together within schools and forming alliances in between schools and one of the outcomes I'd love to see out of this conference would be some electronic means for example and, and apart from other conferences of circulating the good teaching that, that, that goes on and I agree we've got lots of the, the important stuff to sort out I, mean, I absolutely agree with what you're saying that teaching to the test doesn't get the kids through tests any better I've always had much better results in GCSEs than before the GCSE was formed, you know, through not doing that, through interesting learning and teaching. Yeah, and to learn it. Yeah. Learn it off by heart without, you know, I know that's a bit Gogian, but so they know it. That's well, getting that's back to it, no, I say getting kids things. engaged in doing things with a real product a real presentation at the end of it. Something that, the, that something's not alienated activity, alienated labor, but it's actually a product. Mm. And, and just one thing I think we've got to get sorted out between us, this issue of traditional learning, progressive learning, because I think Beast is hopelessly muddled on this. Just because I don't, think he's, I don't think he's muddled. I think he's got it very clear, but it's so, so complex. I think he's got it wrong. Just because progressive education isn't always emancipatory no, doesn't no, mean that traditional that, yeah. methods are either. You know, I would disagree with that. We've got to have fair. critical. We've got to have knowledge, but we have got to develop a critical yeah. sense towards knowledge. Definitely. For me, I, sorry, I'm going to jump in because the reason why those lessons that you showed us, the the rats intestines and the chicken legs, it's because the kids ask the question. Because they ask the question they then wanted to find the answer. Yes. Knowledge came through that process. Mm. If I tell you that I'm going to teach you about something, I'm going to give you the question and the answer, mm. then that's, that's, just, that's boring. Mm. And I'm not really going to care. And it's all laid out on a plate. But if, if you inspire me to ask my own question, and then I'm, I own that question and I'm excited about it, and I go away and I think about how I'm going to answer it, 